thank you so much for taking time out of your day to uh, participate in this interview. What we've done is we've pulled a lot of questions from uh, employees at Dreyfus Ashby and also a lot of the uh, partnering wholesalers across the country just to learn a lot more about uh, the Drabi family, the 7th, 8th, ninth current generations that are coming, why you settled in Orville, the story about Father Pino, um, all the fun stuff that just makes Drapier so special for us. Thank you, Grant. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be able to talk virtually about the house in my, in my family, and I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. Wonderful. So uh, can you kind of just tell us a little bit about the, the history of why you settled in Orville? Oh, yes. So, yes, our, our um, story, our history is very much linked with our location. Everything is really intertwined at Drapier. So we were founded um, 200 years ago in 1808 uh, in Urville. So my ancestors grew, uh, already grew vines 200 years ago. So I'm now the eighth generation. And uh, we settled in Urville because we were drapers. We are, my name is Drapier and, and, and uh, the Aube, so our region was very famous for trading textiles back in the day. So we, our family is really local from the, from the southern part of Champagne. And so we, we started farming grapes in, uh, in the Aube, in the southern part of the Aube, where the monks actually built an abbey 800 years ago. So the story goes back even for uh, from the 1200s, 1200, 1200 um, 1152, when our cellars were built. And uh, our family uh, started growing vines there. And my great grandparents were known for uh, trying to make this sub region even more important in the, in the history of Champagne, uh, with my uh, great grandfather uh, named. Uh, Père Pinot, it was his nickname, because he was uh, so uh, interested in the Pinot Noir qualities that he replanted the Pinot Noir that was taken off uh, from our vineyards over the centuries. The Pinot Noir was brought by uh, the monk in 800 years ago, the monk Saint Bernard, and he uh, started to, uh, to replant it, and which is still the reason why we grow a lot of Pinot Noir in, in Urville and especially at Champagne Drapier. Love it. And so I want to talk more about the, the Pinot in a little bit, but first, you know, we've got a question from Jeff Irish with Favorite Brands and uh, the Cote de it's closer to Chablis than a lot of the other Champagne regions to the north. Uh, so even the soil type with the Kimbergian and Cryo, et cetera, can you kind of tell us about the soil type and Chablis is all Chardonnay, but there's so much Pinot where you are, it's, it's got to be very interesting and a little bit different. Yes, it's definitely, um, terroir is, is, uh, is definitely different where we are in, in Urville and in the Côte des Barres generally. So if you take the map um, of Champagne and, and you imagine um, Paris being the center of a plate, let's say it's a plate, because Paris was the center of a sea and this plate started to be stacked on together because the sea was pressuring it. And then um, the, uh, we, we started to see a hillside showing up because there was so much pressure of the water. The first hillside will be the Marne. It's closer to, to the center of the Parisian basin. It's where you will find uh, Reims, Epernay, and you will find mostly chalk. But when you go further from Paris, the, the, the layers, the ge ge geological layers that show are more ancient than chalk. They are a different type of chalk. They are actually limestone. This is the same layer where you find Chablis and the Côte des Barres, which is Jurassic Kimmergen limestone, which is 300 million years ago. So in this chalk, in, in, in this soil, you have more compacted um, sort of micro uh, organism like uh, shells and oysters. So very, very mineral. It's less porous than chalk. Chalk is really, you write with the, the chalk on the chalkboard. So it's slightly different. With limestone, at home, you cannot take a, a, a stone from the ground and write on the chalkboard. It wouldn't work because it's really, really uh, hard. It, it, uh, it brings a lot of minerality to our wines. The same thing you would find in Chablis. But this is not the only reason why the terroir is different. So that was the soil part. But the second part is the, um, the weather. 
the weather where we have a little bit more uh, warmth because we're south, it takes us about an hour and a half to drive up north to, uh, to, to Reims. But also we are quite in a high altitude of Obviously, it's not like the Alps. It's only 300 uh, meters high, which I don't know would that be um, feet, but it's, it's the highest point of the Champagne region. So we have an interesting temperature variation, having very cool night and a nice sun during the day, which is what helps us keeping a nice acidity too. And this is also very typical of, uh, of uh, of this region of the Côte des Bas, where we have quite steep slope to get a lot of sun during the day and then cool nights. Very good. And then um, kind of a follow-up question to that, Heather Humphrey from Faber Brands wants to know a little bit more about cryo soil. Oh yes, that's a good question. Very technical. Cryo is almost like a, like a local language uh, that my great-grandparents, my, my grandparents use um, it's like um, it's like a fragmented uh, limestone. So um, so it's 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 the limestone, but in in a more fragmented way. So it helps. It brings the um, the possi possible clay in. So the crayo soil of the Grand Sandré. I think you're talking about the Grand Sandré mostly. Uh, adds a little bit more complexity. Speaking of which. <laughs> So delicious. You go. Yes. So this, so you can taste the crayon. Now I tell the story. Now you taste. You can taste it. Um, it brings a little bit more complexity to vintage champagne, which is subsoil that has a little bit more um, uh, texture than only uh, Cambrian limestone. Okay. And and Charlene, you're talking um, going back with some of the family history. But I mean, now in the present world, I mean, you're you're the face of Drapier now, yeah. Oh, well, I'm I'm not the only face of Drapier. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I just, luckily <laughs> I have I have uh, two brothers, and I still work with my father, um, and I am due to take over more of the of the cells. Um, but uh, but the eighth generation were three, so I have the young the my youngest brother who farms mm -hmm. uh, uh, with our, our horses. And Hugo, he's more the, the tech guy. He does, he, he is the one farming and, and supervising the, the, the vineyards and the wine and then more of the, on the sell side. So we will probably uh, work together soon um, as, a, as, a, yeah, as a team. So yeah, but that's exciting. Yeah, it's a cool balance of different uh, skills and so forth. So I love that. Um, so we have, a, we have a question from Robert Kaufman. Uh, with Wango in Washington. Oh, yeah. So but, please, uh, sorry. The, uh, I cannot <laughs> help but have a glass of champagne, of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, the carte or came out in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And the label is so iconic with that yellowish gold and so forth. And it's always roughly, what, 80% Pinot. And stylistically, has it always been as such? And what was kind of the vision for um, such, you know, that famous house champagne that you yeah, so um, it had always been this way. When my grandparents uh, started to make their own wine, which was quite adventurous, the Aube right after the war um, was a very poor region and it was quite bold of them to say, okay, now we've been farmers of grape for so many generations, but we will start making our own champagne. And um, they had a feeling they should use the history and the geography meaning uh, still having, using a lot of Pinot Noir in their blend. And this is what also makes our, what should be a normal non-vintage quite special because most non-vintage champagne would be sort of a balance of the three, uh, three varietals. Being so Pinot Noir oriented is very typical of the Rapier. So even on our Brut non-vintage, normal, he, he, they wanted to focus on Pinot Noir. They wanted to bring the generosity of Pinot Noir but not only. Back then, uh, the drop of Chardonnay makes it more open, more on the peach note. And uh, you, you're referring to the, the yellow label of, um, of the Carte d'Or, because um, as sommelier mentioned, it really reminded them um, of um, quince, quince jelly. I don't know if you're very familiar with this in the US, but it has a very strong aromatic flavor. It goes very well with um, uh, savory food too, like cheese, things like that. So it's not like a, a 
it's not like a dessert sort of fruit. It is is more of a, of a savory, complex, very rich, and it is still something you can taste in the Carte d'Or. They wanted Pinot Noir to be generous, um, still accessible in style, um, Pinot Noir driven, and with a drop of Chardonnay that brings a, a nice uh, balance. Love it. Um, going back into the vineyard itself, we have a question from Jeannie Podraza. What are the, the sustainable practices and kind of organic approach you're taking um, with the vineyards that you own? Yeah, that's a, that's a question that I can answer for two hours, maybe. The great thing um, in, in what we, we've done over the past few uh, decades, I'd say, because my father likes to, to, to say that it's when I was born that he really, really worked hard on sustainable um, uh, um, practices that now extend not only to the vineyards that you're mentioning, but to the whole production process because we're carbon neutral. We're the only house that achieved a com completely net uh, carbon neutral footprint, which is quite complex given the many, many steps that you need to make champagne. So champagne is very unique in a way. It's, it's already quite complex to make wine, right? You have, you start from a plant and you have to deal with the, um, with the tasting. So it's just so wide. But with champagne, you add even more steps like uh, a prise de mousse, uh, second fermentation, or like aging. So you have to think about storage too. Um, but going back to, uh, to, to more of the farming practices, so out of the 60 hectares that uh, we own and uh, 50 hectares more that we farm, so total our team um, supervises 110 hectares, which would be, I think, a little over 300 acres. Yeah. Um, yeah. So all sustainable, uh, not using pesticide, uh, using natural uh, soil covers. Um, so it's, it's a lot of different details. And the, 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 the latest achievement was the uh, organic uh, accreditation on 17 hectares. Uh, which is really complex in Champagne because we have weather conditions that make it really hard. You, you won't find a lot of organic Champagnes on the market. It's really hard. So this is really more of my brother Hugo focuses. He is learning to uh, make uh, all of the efforts that he can. It can be from just uh, you know the flies, the, the wheat he will use, the, the yeast he will use. Every effort he can make, he is researching how far he can go and how deep he can go in that. And it's really interesting because it tackles so many things in our environment. The plants, the, the wine, the sugar, the yeast, the, 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 the weight of the bottle. This is 15% less heavy than a normal champagne bottle. I don't know if you've noticed. Oh, the same with the Grand Sandre, because I know that's a little of, bit of a, of a more of a, of a champagne bottle. So this is, the, the Drapier bottle is slightly different in shape. Mm -hmm. um, and it's 15% lighter, which if you add uh, to the number of bottles that we sell, makes a difference. So this is little details that, 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 we, that we are working on, um, that we worked on, and that helped us achieve a, uh, like a very reduced environmental footprint. That's so neat. I had no idea. Um, so kind of going on the, the opposite side of that with um, climate change and so forth, we, we've got a dual question from Michael Capaldo of Wine Warehouse and Sean Bushy of Young's Arizona. With climate change making effects in the vineyard, um, do you anticipate like replanting any different varietals or do you think the cuvées will change in any way? I mean, how is Trappier gonna kind of combat that moving forward? That's also a very vast question, but a very, very, really good question. Um, climate change has definitely impacted our, um, our type of wine. But so far, and I shouldn't politically say this, so far it hasn't negatively impacted Champagne in the way that maybe 50 years ago, because Champagne is such a northernmost region, we were lacking a little bit of ripeness on the, on the fruit, a ripeness that was sometimes compensated with higher dosage, so sweeter Champagne. Um, so it's interesting to see that over the past few decades, we've, we've had warmer years, bringing just that little bit of ripeness that we needed to make really good vintages. Um, so overall, it hasn't been something really, really uh, negative. But the problem is um, uh, really, really 
warm, like hot, hot years, like we had in 2003, 2006, that completely changed the balance of Champagne. The acidity drops, uh, the alcohol rises, and this is the type of problem that, you, that we may encounter in the past, uh, in the future. Um, we, we did anticipate uh, climate change uh, in the way that we started planting um, the old varietals 20 years ago. Back then it was also, my father saw it as a duty to um, preserve, uh, to protect the varietals that were in, in danger. <laughs> it, it looks like I'm talking about an animal, but actually it's, it's true. There were, uh, the, the three major varietal, varietals were so dominant that maybe those tiny varietals that have uh, some qualities could have disappeared from the appellation. So, and it's interesting to see now that those late ripening um, varietals like Arban or Petit Mélier are now of good interest in sometimes during the very hot years, it can bring a nice acidity to the blend. So, but that's not the first purpose why we, we, we planted those grapes. However, now the, um, the, the interprofessional committee is working on perhaps using some of the features of those uh, varieties to, to work on a future variety that can handle um, uh, climate change. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, speaking of those varietals, the, the Quator? Yeah, yeah. So Quatuor it was a project that my, my father started 15 years ago. So back then it was really like a big fight to talk about those varieties because Champagne has changed so much over the past 15 years, which is great because now we're introducing more diversity, more variety, and diversity is now accepted. And he wanted to, 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 to show that these varietals are interesting when they are uh, being approached with a more modern way, meaning back in the days they were using these varietals, not even waiting for them to be ripe. So they were not making great wine out of it because it was not ripe. Uh, and then they, they didn't really know uh, how to use them when in terms of uh, vinification. And he used his skills of like, let's try this, try that. Um, and he wanted to make a blanc de blanc with only 25% of Chardonnay. So the quatuor is actually a quarter of each of those varietals. And it's called the quatuor because each of those varietals play an equal role and is important in the balance. It's not like we say, oh, we're gonna put 10% of this varietal just to say that we're gonna you know, use it in the blend. It actually plays a role and you can, and you can recognize it in the blend. So it's very original, quite unique but we still want it to taste like champagne. So it's not going to be like the completely funky, cloudy uh, sh champagne. Um, it still tastes like champagne. It's just like you cannot really tell what varietal it is. And it really is, is a small production. We make 2,000 bottles a year, so it's really, it's a treat. It's, it's a treat. It's a really fun, geeky champagne. Um, if people haven't had it, it's, it's just, I, I love tasting people on that just because it's so much fun expose people to different varietals. So, um, all right, we got another question from Jerry Horn of Tiburon. And Jarabi has always been known as using very little to no sulfites in all the different champagnes. And then like, how does that affect the longevity and shelf life of these? And also the character of the champagnes itself. Yeah, yeah, so sulfite is another of my dad's long-term research project. Um, it just started as like the, the observation that uh, champagne had way too much sulfite and that what if we could do without sulfite or with less sulfite, which was something also quite new, like 15, 20 years ago. Now it's more of a topic like natural wine, no sulfite, but could you imagine that 20 years ago, the world was not really ready for it. So he had to prove we could make a non-sulfite added champagne or low sulfite added champagne and, for the, and the champagne had to be very clean. Um, his perception of champagne is like, it doesn't go oxidized, it shouldn't go cloudy. And he wanted to prove that you can make a normal traditional champagne with low sulfur. So um, he, 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 he just, like, his idea was like, why add it if you don't need it? Um, but in terms of character, it's, um, the, the really like the people who love non-sulfite champagne say that maybe the 
the, the character is a bit more open-minded because sulfur is like a preservative, not open-minded, just open. <laughs> um, because uh, uh, sulfur acts as a preservative, it, it could, you know, um, freeze a little bit the, the flavors because it is a preservative. So when you don't use it, the, the flavors tend to be a little bit more wild. Um, so that's something that, that affects a little bit the character. But um, we still believe that a good non-sulfite champagne, you, you should not be able to taste that it's non-sulfite. It should um, behave completely like a normal champagne, which is, which is a point that we make at Drapier to make a straight, clean champagne. That leads me to the second question about shelf life. Uh, we haven't had any issue really with uh, shelf life uh, in the past. It's true that it's not a champagne that you will have it sit on shelf for four years, but if you have it sit on shelf for one year, one year and a half, it's no problem. Why? Because it's, a, it's not a non-sulfite still wine, it's a non-sulfite champagne. And in champagne, you have carbon dioxide that, pres that, that protects from oxidation. So it will actually behave better than, uh, you know, a, a still non-sulfite, uh, a still wine that is non-sulfite. So, of course, you don't buy a non-sulfite champagne to, you know, have it sit there and drink it in four or five years because there's not really a point. But if you want to drink it two, three years after, there's no problem at all. And even if it travels, as long as it travels in good condition, if you don't put it in a, you know, in the microwave or anything, it should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, um... Even even with the champagnes that you are adding sulfites to, I mean, it's so much smaller than a lot of the other, um, I don't know, a, a lot of other champagne houses. Can you just talk about, you know, the parts per liter, et cetera, and how much lower you are than some other champagne houses? Yeah, so we use approximately on those that have added sulfite, but it's always a uh, very small, between 20 and 25 milligrams uh, uh, of uh, of sulfite per liter, which is really small, but usually champagne ranges from 70, 80, 90. Really, we're using like a, a fraction of that. Um, so it's even those that have the, the the wines that have a little bit of sulfur, a sulfur intolerant person will not will not taste it at all because it's so 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 thin. But we had to uh, design redesign entirely the uh, the winery for that so if you come to your bill you'll see um that it's all gravity driven for example there's no uh, oxidation at any point of the process we protect the wine we naturally protect the wine by not shocking the wine to any uh, any uh, yeah air or oxi uh, oxidation at all love it um and then we have a question from Kristen ford from favorite brands the liqueur for the dosage is really unique with with Trappier. and um, I remember when I, we were at the winery last fall. Uh, I got to make sure Bob throws some pictures on here. I mean, it's really something special. What's what's the story? And what makes it so unique? Yeah, so those are is another story at Drapier. <laughs> um, maybe I, I I start talking about like. Dosage at Drapier is very special because we were in the forefront of making no dosage champagne. So this, the story started like that. In the 90s, my father said, uh, maybe we have a terroir to make very uh, dry wine. So he started to make no dosage champagne, which is the Brut Nature that I have here, um, which was really one of the first Brut Nature on the market 20 years ago. And then his approach to dosage on the champagne on the cuvées that actually need a dosage because zero dosage is not for all, all champagne. He said, um, the dosage that I want to use in the Carte d'Or or in the Rosé or even the Grand Cendré has to be the one that I, I picture uh, with, my, with the, the final wine. So he, it's completely, it's entirely part of the, of the process of creating the wine, which was quite new because before dosage was taboo. So he, uh, started collecting all of the um, all the liqueur de dosage that we had for um, uh, my great grandparents, for my grandparents, and building what we now call the licotech. So it's, ba it's basically a library of of liqueur de dosage. The oldest is uh, I think 47, 1947. Wow. 
Wow. And we now keep them in dummy jones, so I think that's the thing that you're referring to when you talk about uh, uh, what you saw in the room is that those dummy jones um, full of very dense old sugar, 50 year old sugar that is complex, that is um, really melt, that's so very soft and that will not um, uh, change the, the flavors of the, of the champagne, that will respect the flavors of the champagne. So we're really the only one using this type of, of liqueur dosage. We make it ourselves using our own wine. So the, the wine that we don't use for the champagne, adding two third of um, cane sugar, organic cane sugar. And then we age those liqueurs for a minimum 20 years in oak barrels. And when we're done with the aging, at least the oak aging, we put them in glass, so demi johns, and then we, we start uh, uh, picking them depending on, 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 on what champagne we want to have in the end. So it's, it, it is really unique in, in this way, yeah. And, and speaking of oak aging, um, you, you got to talk about the egg, the oak egg. <laughs> but just, the, you're unveiling a future project here. <laughs> Hey, I mean, sneak peek, you know? <laughs> yeah, so the, that's, that's project number 50, which is the egg, um, the egg-shaped uh, barrel that, uh, that we had in 2012. So in 2012, we had our first, first vintage of Grand Cendré, specially aged in, in an oak barrel, which is very unique because it, uh, it is an organic shape. It's like the golden number and this organic shape helps to have a constant movement in the egg. So it's like the very low intervention. You don't touch the wine for two years, um, sometimes, uh, yeah, so around two years and um, sometimes three. And, uh, and it has its own life, you know, within, within the egg. It's, uh, it will make uh, 3,000 bottles of special Grand Cendré with this very both organic shape and organic material. Because you see egg in the wine world in cement, but really rarely in oak. So with the oak barrel, egg-shaped oak barrel, you combine this very unique shape with the very breathing uh, material of oak. So we expect it to be um, quite stellar. And actually we've been tasting the Vin Claire recently and we decided to postpone the, the reveal of the Grand Cendré Ovum because it was tasting so fresh, which is, which is you know, uh, actually a good sign. We were surprised at how balanced and fresh it was tasting. So we still have a, probably a, a year, maybe just a year to wait until uh, you can taste it. Very fun. Well I'm excited to try it whenever it comes out. So, um, question from Michael Capaldo from Wine Warehouse: uh, When nobody's when nobody's looking, what's your go-to champagne and favorite food pairing to go with it? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> when nobody's looking, yeah. Well, that happens to me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think. Well, that's maybe because we're still when. We have very long and summer days. I think one of my favorite would be the Brut Nature Rosé, which is so unique because it combines all of the um, intense flavors of a Seignier method rosé, which is very unique in Champagne also. We don't blend red wine and white wine to make our rosé. We do the Seignier, so skin contact maceration on the whole batch. So it, it, it extracts a lot of fruit flavor, also of color. So if you've noticed, sometimes our rosé um, maybe a little um, darker than, you, you, than you're you used to. That's because of the skin contact maceration, which brings a lot of very uh, uh, bright um, fruit, red fruit flavors with the no dosage. So you're never really um, fed up with it because it has no sugar. So it still has the minerality we were talking earlier. It combines the fruit of the Pinot Noir, the, almost the tannins, with the saltiness of Kimmeridgean limestone. It's, um, it's, a, it's a small production, uh, but it's definitely something unique that I, I could go uh, through a bottle, not by myself, on a, on a, on a summer night, no problem. <laughs> and what are you eating with it? Oh, <clears throat> this is great with actually things that are almost spicy. So um, ceviche, you know, with a bit of lime, with a little bit of uh, 
of cilantro, um, almost Asian influenced food, which is really hard to pair with wine. And this would work with, uh, with uh, scallops, uh, um, yeah, any type of, uh, of crudos, of course. Well, I live in the Northwest, so I'm used to all the seafood. I've got to try that soon. And then uh, kind of wrapping up, you know, the, a lot of the American consumers kind of look at champagne for special occasions or celebrations. You and I see it as an everyday drink. How do we kind of change that mindset for a lot of the general public? Good question. That's what I'm trying to do every day. For example, just the idea of uh, suggesting people to have their champagne before the meal, when they're toasting rather than just waiting until your palate is overwhelmed with the with uh, flavors to, to, to have it with the dessert, which is really, really not doing, uh, do, doing a favor to the wine because it's killing the wine. And then you think, oh, champagne, it's really high, uh, too acidic for me. No, that's because you had it at the end of the meal. So um, I think like starting to enjoy dry champagne like this, mm -hmm. because you're naturally inclined to enjoy it at the beginning, because this is when your palate is fresh, um, crisp, and then you, you, when you make also very vinous champagne, which is our case, Pinot Noir, we really are a food friendly uh, champagne house. And we want to prove that you can pair Pinot Noir driven champagne with any type of food. So what we're doing at the estate uh, is like a pair champagne dinner, or only champagne dinner. People are just so surprised because they never experienced that, like having a vintage on your main course with a veal, poultry, um, red meat is a little tricky, but may, even a tartare, for example, like a red meat tartare works, not really the cooked one, but um, people are just so surprised. And once they experience it, they're like, oh, I can go, I can buy this. And actually it, it, it takes me um, through the course of my meal. It's, it's, uh, it's one of the most versatile wines that people don't think of. And I really encourage people to spread the world of, uh, of champagne and food. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I think one of my favorite things about Tarapier is how seamless all the champagnes are. None of them are bitter. They're always super food friendly and delicious. Um, and they're just so versatile. And, and it's, it's fun seeing people's reaction when you pour them, pour them Tarapier that they never had and kind of telling the story and how special it is. So Charlene, I can't thank you enough. This was really fantastic to, to kind of take, you know, 30, 40 minutes out of your day and to run through these questions we can't share to we can't wait to share all this fun info with our partnering wholesalers and uh the rest of travis ashby and wish you the best uh, remaining 2020 and hope to see you soon thank you grant thank you dreyfus ashby i i can't wait to coming back to the u.s again i know uh, i'm i hope to um, to meet you physically uh, soon and and that we can toast together <laughs> oh, santé. Santé, santé.